Welcome to Diffused Congruence. This is episode six of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan. I'm your host, and I'm joined once again by my partner, Parvez Ahmed. Welcome, everybody. Uh, sorry, we're a week late, but uh, hopefully this will make up for it, because I think we have a terrific episode. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, come, uh, we present this episode in March, and uh, Black History Month has just ended. Uh, and one thing that we've really wanted to do with this show is present sort of an oral history of the Muslim experience in America. And I don't think you can really talk about that without talking about uh, how intrinsically tied it is with the African-American experience in this country. And so we're very honored to have with us as our guest this episode, uh, Imam Abu Qadir al-Amin. He has been an imam since 1981. Uh, he served in Oakland. He served as a chaplain at the Federal Correctional Institute in Pleasanton in the Bay Area. And he is currently the imam of the San Francisco Muslim Community Center, uh, a position he's served at since 1984. So, Imam Abu Khazir, thank you so much for joining us. It's a privilege. I'm honored to be here with both of you, and I'm uh, looking forward to our discussion. Well, just just to start things out, I think uh, it might be helpful to give our audience a frame of reference of where uh, you were in life when your path crossed with Islam. Uh, when I was in the eighth grade, uh, that would be 1964, uh, the Nation of Islam gained a lot of popularity in the city that I lived in, which happens to be uh, Vallejo, California. So many of my peers, my family members, my older brother in particular, and many of my peers, people that I went to school with, uh, became uh, interested in the Nation of Islam teachings as it was being taught then uh, by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So my older brother began bringing literature home. Uh, quite a number of my friends accepted and became uh, practicing members of the Nation of Islam, and our friendship continued uh, so I began to learn about Islam at about 14 years old. Islam as it was taught then uh, right. in the Nation of Islam. And it had an impact on me because I saw it actually transform individuals' lives. People that I knew, I saw dramatic changes in their character and their behavior. And it was a major improvement. So that got my attention. An improvement in what sense? That uh, they became better people in terms of their uh, conduct, uh, some of the behavior that they had prior to being introduced to uh, Islam as it was being taught then was uh, not the best behavior. Sure. Some of them had some thuggish characteristics and uh, even some criminal leanings, sure. and they were involved with drugs and alcohol. And when I say drugs, I'm talking about marijuana and pills, not hard drugs. Mm -hmm. So you're 14, yeah. and you have enough awareness at that time to be like, something's going on here. Right. I was always, I've always been a reader. So my brother used to bring literature home, and I would read it. And I would study, and I would read. And I've always been a thinker. So I would contemplate things. I've always wanted to figure things out. I wasn't just comfortable... Uh, with the, the way things were on the surface. I wanted a deeper understanding. So I was in search of information, even at a young age. Mm. So you joined the a nation now, what is it, 1965, 66? I actually didn't join. Yeah. Okay. I didn't join the Nation of Islam until uh, 1970. Okay. Though uh, 1967, I began to actively claim myself as a Muslim. Okay. Though I didn't have a formal uh, mosque or temple that I was a member of, mm -hmm. if you question me about my religion, then I, I would claim Islam. Uh, and that was my experience. I had a, a marijuana possession in 1967 and ended up in the California Youth Authority. Okay. And while I was in the California Youth Authority, they take you through these psychological tests and things to try to classify you and see where you fit in. Uh -huh. And one of the questions they asked was religion. So, of course, at that time, uh, I didn't identify myself as a Christian, 
So I identified myself as a Muslim, and when I got to uh, Preston School of Industry, which is uh, north of Sacramento, uh, there were about 18 of us that professed Islam. Okay. And we had a little knowledge. We were reading at that time Malcolm X's biography, and we had some access to uh, information about Islam, but it was very limited. We knew the dietary code, yeah. and we knew that we didn't worship Jesus, but we didn't we didn't know how to pray or anything of that nature. Right. So uh, you were you were seventeen. Seventeen years old at that time, nineteen sixty seven. So now, you know, we're talking now, again. Malcolm X is assassinated in nineteen sixty five. Uh, what were so what were the attitudes towards Malcolm within the nation uh, when you joined it, that, whether formally or informally, when you begin to identify with the nation? Uh, when I began to identify with the nation, uh, Malcolm had already, 1964, 65, right. he had already uh, discovered some things that made him uncomfortable with the nation. Mm -hmm. So his name within the nation of Islam was not popular. Hmm. Uh, it was almost like uh, it was not mentioned. I see. And then uh, when I became actively involved in 1970, and was receiving literature from Chicago and received my ex and received my orientation package and prayers and things like that, uh, he was not uh, discussed among the Nation of Islam members. So, it was like bringing up... Uh, uh, like Judah or, or Benedict yeah. Arnold or something, right? It was just, it was just persona non grata. Yeah. Right, it was just not discussed. I had my own view because I had read... Uh, his book when I was in the Youth Authority, so I had the opinion that Malcolm was more politically inclined than he was religiously inclined. Mm -hmm. And then as I as I reflected over his delivery uh, later on in life, his emphasis was mainly social and political and not really religious. Uh, he was more concerned about the plight of the people right. than he was about uh, just talking about religion. Okay. Now, with specifically with regards to religion or the religious ethos of the nation, um, you mentioned how you know you got your ex, you got your prayer book or whatever, right? right? So there was kind of an a, a induction into the nation. I mean, it wasn't a formal shahada as it, we would identify it. It was a okay, shahada. It was, a shahada. Too. it was it was witnessing. There was no God but Allah. And Muhammad was his messenger. Okay, and then there was also a difference of. Uh, points of view, mm. uh, Elijah Muhammad, he never claimed himself to be a prophet. I see. Uh, so he tried to distinguish between carrying the message of his teacher, Mr. W.D. Farad, or uh, Wali Farad Muhammad, he used different names. That's right. Uh, he distinguished pro prophet from messenger. Interesting. So he didn't claim prophethood, though he did acknowledged that he was given a message from W.D. Farad to take to his people. And uh, he he saw his role as cleaning us up mm -hmm. from those behaviors that we had adopted from this dominant culture that were uh, against our nature and, uh, you know, our uh, Muslim identity. So he, he made a distinction between that. And uh, I remember uh, one of the prayers that I received in 1970 when I got my ex was uh, he said uh, what we call the morning prayer okay. uh, which is uh, so the morning prayer was uh, and he sent that to me in English and in transliteration. Okay. And okay. I learned the transliteration and I learned the English. Surely I've turned myself being upright to him who originated the heavens and earth, and I'm not of the polytheist. Surely my prayers, my sacrifice, my life, and my death, all for Allah, no associate says he, and I am commanded to be of the Muslims. So that was the first prayer I learned. It's right out of the Quran. Right, I, yeah, I know. That's right. Yeah. That was no, the no. first prayer I learned right. that I received from Elijah Muhammad. And then after that, I learned Al Fatiha that's right. and uh, Kul Hu Allahu Ahad. Right. So those were three prayers that he sent to me, along with uh, 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 giving me my ex, which was I received it May 27, 1970. Uh, while I was on death row, San Quentin's death row. Now, for, for the sake of our listeners, could you expand on the significance of that, of getting your ex? 
uh, getting my ex was really uh, what we call having our name placed in the book of life. And we were joining on to our original nation, which we considered ourselves uh, the lost found nation of Islam in the wilderness of North America. We never called ourselves black Muslims. That was a name that was bestowed upon us by the media. Mm -hmm. It was made uh, very popular by uh, Dr. C. Eric Lincoln, who wrote a book, uh, Black Muslims in America. That's right. And, but that was never a, a title or image that we gave to ourselves. We weren't viewing ourselves just in terms of uh, our color. Uh, we considered ourselves to be a part of the universal uh, body of Muslims all over this earth. So, I mean, given that, there were obviously, there, I mean, there are, we know, the, the distinctions between uh, the Nation of Islam and, you know, quote-unquote, mainstream Islam. So, w yes. was was there a recognition of those differences when, when you were a part of it, or is that something you gradually became aware of? Right. We, we uh, it was acknowledged from the very beginning that uh, we were what Elijah Muhammad used the terminology, baby nation. And we were kind of like in an incubator situation mm -hmm. where because we had special needs, we were not to uh, interact with the main body of Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was very protective of us. And that was a part of the philosophy that we were indoctrinated with. That and we had a special Islam. Was, was that by design to prevent, for example, what happened with Malcolm X? Uh, I don't think it was particularly for that reason, I think because uh, I think it was more like when you have a new baby mm -hmm. and just to allow strangers to visit the house and be around that baby is just not a wise thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I think it was just a general protection, sure, sure. not a specific protection. And uh, Mr. W.D. Farad, who designed the structure of the Nation of Islam, he knew Islam. And we believe that he was experimenting on how to introduce Islam into the African-American community, uh, but doing it in a very strategic way. And so what he did, he took many ideas from what was going on in the popular culture, and he wrapped all of that around the Quran and Islam mm -hmm. and gave us those things and said that this is a perfect book. And eventually, we believe that his intention was that we would accept the book and leave off those other things that were not truly Islam. Uh, the ideas about a spaceship hmm. and ideas about uh, creating uh, but the races, the races and right. things like that, they wouldn't scientifically hold up. And he told us that Islam was mathematics and that it's, and mathematics was Islam, so meaning that you could scientifically come to a conclusion on whether something's truthful or not just by using scientific measures. And uh, we were told to seek knowledge and to get root knowledge, not to just go on what was on the surface, but to dig deep okay. and try to uh, uh, gain higher insight into uh, even what he was giving us. So, this, so now we're, we're talking early 70s at this point, right. and you're you're firmly sort of ensconced in the nation. Right. I'm praying five times a day. Actually, I was praying uh, Tahajit prayer because uh, I had learned how to pray uh, Tahajit uh, while I was incarcerated uh, mm -hmm. in, in prison. And uh, you could order books from uh, Muhammad Speaks newspaper. So, uh, you know, once a year you could receive packages from your family. So I would encourage my family to send me books. So they would send me uh, books that were available from the Muhammad Speaks newspaper. So I had access to the Quran. I had Hadith books. I had history books on the life of uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, I had plenty of time to read, study, and reflect. That's right. So, so like the five daily prayers, the emphasis on Hadith, and, 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 and of course the quest for knowledge was certainly there. But these were all practices that were, um, I don't want to say endorsed or approved, or, or I guess they were by the nation, right? I mean, they were encouraged by the nation to pray well, five They times. were actually, the prayers, I listened to a, yeah. a lecture uh, where Im uh, Malcolm X introduced uh, Imam W.D. Muhammad. Okay. At that time, Minister, Minister Wallace D. Muhammad. That's right. In 1959. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. And okay. uh, he taught the prayer. He went through the whole prayer in the lecture. He talked about the positions of prayer, the Qiyam, Ruku. This is Imam Muhammad. This is Imam Muhammad in 1959. The okay, okay. And then also uh, there are publications that were presented, uh, printed in 1956 where uh, uh, Imam Muhammad's brother, Akbar, was teaching the prayer mm-hmm. in the book with, you know, the names in Arabic and on the board and all of that. So, and then people don't know this. Mm-hmm. Uh, 19, I believe it was 1955, uh, Elijah Muhammad hired Dr. Jamil Diab, a Palestinian professor, to teach Quranic Arabic in the University of Islam in Chicago. And uh, he was evolving away from what he had been given. And then in his publication, uh, Message this to the Black Man, this is Elijah Muhammad. Muhammad. In Message to the Black Man, and uh, uh, there's a section in there, What is Islam? Uh-huh. And he teaches the five principles and the articles of faith. And there's a section in there where he teaches the prayers. He said the prayers of the Muslims are the best, and we should pray the five daily prayers of the Muslims. So he was teaching this all the time. At the same time, it was overshadowed by the controversial aspects right. of the white man is the devil mm-hmm. and Yaqub's history and That's right. all of those things were a little more controversial and okay. asking for some of these states, you know, he said, give us some of the states in the South and right. help us for 20 years and let us become an independent nation if you don't want to treat us right. Mm-hmm. It was conditional, you know, mm-hmm. but those controversial things overshadowed the moral and the uh, religious teachings that he also emphasized. Okay. So now, uh, you bring up Imam Muhammad, and so I, I, I'd like for you to speak about what the relationship is now between him and his father and how um, you know Imam Muhammad sort of embarks on his own evolution. Right. Well, and, and it might yeah. be helpful just yeah. for our audience sake to, to give a frame of reference on who Imam Muhammad oh, is. Right, right. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Imam W.D. Muhammad was the seventh child uh, born to Elijah Muhammad and Clara uh, Muhammad, Clara Evans Poole Muhammad, and okay. Elijah yeah. Poole, Poole Muhammad. Right. Mm-hmm. That was their name prior to uh, them being given a name by their teacher mm-hmm. uh, that reconnected them with their history as, you know, uh, slave, from coming from slavery to America. Uh, And he was the seventh son. Uh, His teacher, Mr. W.D. Farad, uh, when he came... The teacher of Elijah Muhammad. The teacher of Elijah Muhammad. That's right. Master W.F. Muhammad, uh, Wali Farad Muhammad, or W.D. Farad. He used all three names. Uh, When he... uh, When Clara Muhammad was carrying Imam W.D. Muhammad... He wrote his initials on the back door of the house in Michigan. And uh, I think it was Hamtramck, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit. He wrote the initials WDM on the back door. He said, if the child is a boy, give the child my name. So he was named uh, Wallace D. Muhammad. Uh, Imam W.D. Muhammad thinks that uh, he was actually saying Wallace. But because some people from South Asia like the Japanese, have a problem with the L's and R's. So he believes he was saying Wallace Sadeem Muhammad, mm. and they got Wallace got it. instead of Wallace, Wallace, Wallace. Sadeem. Because his own, uh, the, the ethnicity or the sort of, yeah, I mean, or sort of mysterious, right, of, of, of Fard Muhammad. Or, I mean, we know he's from Asia, or we think he's, he may have been Asian. Right. Well, there's uh, Indian, maybe. I mean, is there a possibility? There are those who think there's a lot of evidence to suggest he came from what is now Pakistan. Okay. Right. And uh, there are individuals who have played that role, whether they were him or not. That's a controversial issue. Interesting. But there are some who say he lived in this area Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Hayward, California. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And uh, I knew him personally. And I heard him tell people that Actually, he was that I've person. I've heard that too because I think, yeah, I was someone who met his son or something. Yeah, yeah. Out, out in this area. Well, actually, he was in this area also. Right, Mr. right, right, right. Mr. W. D. Farad. But we won't go into that country. Right, right, right. <laughs> so now, okay, coming back so to Imam Muhammad. He was then. the seventh That's child. Right. He was also uh, at twelve years old. He be, he was raised on the Nation of Islam philosophy, taught by his father and his mother. Uh, primarily by his mother because 
uh, from 1934 to 1942, uh, Elijah Muhammad was on the run because uh, some of the ministers who were taught by Mr. W.D. Farad didn't agree with him being the leader of the organization after Mr. Farad left. So he ran, uh, he was a... Uh, actually traveling on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So he set up, Mr. Farad set up three temples. Mm -hmm. Temple uh, number one in Detroit, temple yeah. number two in uh, uh, Chicago, temple number three in Milwaukee, and then Elijah mm -hmm. Muhammad set up the first temple in D.C., which became temple number four, Washington, D.C. And then from there, uh, temple number five, I believe, was Baltimore, Temple Number no. 6 was in uh, uh, Massachusetts, Boston, I believe. Temple Number no. 7 was in uh, New York, and then Temple Number no. 8 was in San Diego, California. Uh -huh. And then uh, uh, it began to grow. So at the time of his passing, I believe there were over 80 temples. The time of uh, Elijah Muhammad's passing in 1975. Right. So W.D. Muhammad yeah. was raised on those right. teachings. At okay. 12 years old, it was documented that him and his older brother, Elijah Muhammad II, while he was 12 years old, they were collect questioning the philosophy of man being God while in the backyard. And uh, uh, Imam W.D. Muhammad was asking his older brother, how could Mr. Farad be God when this tree is older than him? Because we were told that he was born in 1877. So he was, at a very young age, he was saying, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, and uh, he never made that a, a issue because he respected the work that his father was doing. Right. Uh, and then he became a minister uh, over the, the mosque in Philadelphia in the early uh, 60s, uh, maybe 1960. Uh, from 1960 to 1963, he was over Temple Number 12 in Philadelphia, mm. and then he went to prison for not registering for the draft. For the draft, right? So he, he's going back. You, you mentioned he was he's born in Michigan. He was born. He's in, born in uh, Michigan. Family? Then his family moved to Chicago. Got it. Got it. Okay. Chicago, okay. Illinois. Right. Right. And during that period, uh, also, uh, he was homeschooled. Okay. The Muslims. Uh, were the pioneers in homeschooling uh, mm -hmm. because we didn't believe at that time uh, that the uh, public schools could respect us adequately and they made mockery of the names and things of that nature. So we were also uh, had what we called the University of Islam. That's right. So W.D. Muhammad was raised uh, and educated within that school system. Okay. Uh, matter of fact, one of the truant officers came to the home once and was discussing with his mother the need to put the children in the public schools and uh, he was standing at the door when it, with his mother and he told us this story mm -hmm. uh, and uh, while this was going on the truant officer said if she didn't they would take him to court and put him in jail and she said you before I put my children in your schools I'll be door, dead as this door frame hmm. and said that Truant officer left and never came back. This is Sister Claire Muhammad. This is Claire Muhammad. In 1940, I believe it was 1942, he said he was maybe eight or nine years old at that time. Okay, so, oh, so he's born in the late 30s. He was born in 1933, October the 30th, 1933. So he was born during the three and a half year period when right. Mr. W.D. Farad taught his father. Got it. Okay. And, uh, so now he he raises he sort of rises through uh, through the ranks. He becomes a minister and, and rises in the ranks. Um, and, now, and, and like you said, sort of he's always sort of he questioning the theological you know sort of underpinnings of the nation uh, and, and some of the other things. And he's going through his own evolution while that's happening. Right. He's studying the Quran. Right. Like I said, uh, Mr. Jamil Diab was the Arabic teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some of the students that were in that class, his brother, who's Professor Akbar Muhammad at Binghamton University yeah. in New York, That's was right. in that class. He was in that class, and one of our respected imams in Chicago, Imam Darnell Kareem, and his wife Gloria were also in that class. And uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Professor Diab is reported to have said was that 
Uh, the three outstanding students in that class were his brother Akbar, him, Imam W.D. Muhammad, and Darnell Kareem. He said Akbar had the most fluent ability to speak the language. Mm. He said Imam W.D. Muhammad had the greatest insight into the language. And Darnell Kareem had the most melodic, uh, beautiful voice. Mm -hmm. And he became, uh, he's known as a Awa Bilal because he can really call the Adhan. He has a very beautiful uh, rendering of the of the, of the Adhan. Right. So, so now, like, and, and, and you mentioned Bilal, uh, you know, um, and now I, that's also a, sort of a chapter or a footnote in the history, right? Where, you know, yeah. this, now does this happen after the death of Elijah Muhammad where... Yeah, uh, the the in 1970 it was around 1976. Uh -huh. uh, we started uh, identifying with Bilal, That's right. and we thought that all of the African American people should identify with Bilal, right. who was subjected to uh, being enslaved, and then was liberated uh, by virtue of accepting Islam. So we thought that was a good segue into doing Dawa in our communities, right. in our neighborhoods, and we actually uh, adopted the name as an ethnic name, Bilalians. Bilalians. Now, for, for, for the listening audience, uh, Bilal is one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, and uh, he is uh, an Abyssinian slave who comes into Islam. He, in fact, is the first uh, Muazzin. In, in Islamic history, or the one who calls the prayer because of his melodic voice. Uh, so, so that's just to give a little bit of a historical framework. Right. So, 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 okay, I, I didn't realize that was so late because I, I do want to talk about um, that Imam Muhammad within the nation now. Uh, you know, he, he's sort of suspended because of some of the teachings that he that because he well, sort of breaks away from the traditional nation teachings. There were several uh, occasions when right. uh, kind of he was excommunicated. Was, right. He was excommunicated in 1963, mm -hmm. uh, along with uh, his nephew Sharif, uh, Raymond Sharif's son. Uh, both of them had problems accepting the idea of Mr. Farad Muhammad as God. Okay, so we're still there. And so yeah. right. uh, on one occasion, uh, Imam Deputy Muhammad shared with us that he was... Uh, excommunicated based on a conversation he had with his father and he said I understand that you're not teaching that Mr. Farad is our savior and he said well that's your savior daddy <laughs> and uh, he's my savior what do you mean my savior so he was saying that uh, he said I, would, I could see you more as a savior than I can see Mr. Farad as a savior because I see you doing the work. So, you know, his father, they differed on that idea. Okay. And uh, he was excommunicated. And on one occasion, he was told uh, he could come back. Uh, so he wrote, he, because when he was excommunicated, he couldn't talk to any members of the Nation of Islam, nor his family. Okay. And he said he knew his father, that that would bother him, because his father knew the love that he had for his family members, his mother, his brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, so every year they would have the annual Savior's Day. Right. And uh, he was told he could come back if he would apologize before the congregation. Mm -hmm. So he came back and he said his apology was never disagree with the big boss with a mind to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> So this is like early 60s. This is 63. 60, 63. Right. right. And so he has a series of suspensions, I think the right. last of which was 1974, uh, right prior to the death of, of, of Elijah Muhammad. Uh, he came back in yeah. 72. It wasn't okay. 74. Okay, okay. He came back in 72. Uh -huh. uh, he had uh, did a, a lecture, a public lecture on a radio program. That's right. And the lecture was titled, Mythological Gods, the Burden on America. Mm, okay. And so in that message, the idea of mythological gods, not only did it uh, condemn the Trinitarian concept of God, but it also condemned the Nation of Islam's idea of, uh, of Mr. Farad Muhammad as being God in person. Okay. So uh, Imam W.D. Muhammad uh, was brought his, uh, up on charges for giving that lecture, and his father heard the lecture. They brought the radio program to him, and uh, he told his wife, Clara, 
while the ministers were all at the table, this is what we've been praying for. Mm. My son's got it. And he can go and preach that gospel anywhere. So he came back into the nation of Islam and he began to teach from 1973, 74, 75. W.D. Muhammad was going around the country teaching the ministers and teaching the community mm. uh, prior to Elijah Muhammad's passing. Okay. And uh, I heard one of the ministers from this area, he said he heard Imam W.D. Muhammad teach in 1973 or 74. He said, and in 15 minutes, he undid what I thought I had learned in 15 years. <laughs> wow. uh, so he had profound insight. Right. And yeah, uh, right. one of the tools that he said he discovered that helped him to understand Mr. Farad's mythology was uh, a book written by Joseph Campbell called The Mass of God. Joseph and uh, he picked that book up at a uh, Fields bookstore in San Francisco on Polk Street. And it, it's just so coincidentally, Phil's bookstore was owned by uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's uncle. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. And, uh, wow. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. you're talking about congruence, congruence. right? Congruence, <laughs> that's right, that's right. So it's interesting. Uh, so then now, is, so the, do I have it right? So in 1975, Elijah Muhammad dies. 1976, would you say, is where... Um, Imam W.D. Muhammad really begins to take the community away from the teachings of the nation? Uh, I mean, the world community of Islam in the West, is that? I mean, that's the first incarnation, if you will, of the post-nation of Islam community. Is that, is that right or is that not right? That's the most visible sign of okay, that. Okay. But right away, people knew... Some people knew that Imam W.D. Muhammad was going to take the community in a different direction. I see. Because his father taught us that. I was prepared for that, mm -hmm. personally, because I remember the first uh, article that I read from Elijah Muhammad that I really paid attention to uh, was in 1968. And it was an article that was titled, He Allah Makes All Things New. And he was saying in the next... The leader coming after him would bring a new Islam. Mm. And he said the message, the light would be different. He said everything would be different in the new world of Islam. So he was actually preparing the community for changes. Mm. And uh, so when, uh, when I heard Imam W.D. Muhammad teaching in 1975, I related it to what his father had said about uh, a new leader coming who was going to teach a... Uh, teach a, a different Islam that would be easier. He said it was a new book coming and it was going to be a small book. Mm. And then when I saw how small the Quran was mm. and you know before we had uh, the Quran but we didn't have the emphasis on the Arabic language right. in the manner that Imam W.D. Muhammad in introduced it to us as. A book to study, a book to follow, right. a book to live by. Uh, previously it was more symbolic for most of the Right. Followers of I know some people who have their own historical roots to the nation of Islam. Uh, I'm speaking specifically of someone like Imam Siraj Wahaj, who I had the, who I have the fortune of knowing personally. And I remember he mentioned that the first time he had ever heard the Quran recited in the Arabic language was, in fact, Imam W. D. Muhammad. Right. And I think that was probably the case for a lot of people within the nation. But when when Siraj came into the nation of Islam, he was supposed to hear Malcolm, and uh -huh. Malcolm didn't come that night. Hmm. Imam okay. Muhammad came. <laughs> That's so well, even when he came well, into the nation of Islam, his first uh, exposure, exposure to Islam was through Imam W.D. Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And I've had discussions with Imam Siraj. We went on Hajj together in 1988. Beautiful. And, he, he performed my marriage. I, I got married. He, he married me and my wife. Yeah. So we, we, we're, we're, we're friends. That's right. And uh, the experiences on the East Coast yeah. were different than the experiences on the West Coast. Interesting. And because I was in a, uh, 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 I grew up with people in the Nation of Islam that I knew before they were in the Nation of Islam. And uh, the spiritual component of it on the West Coast, I appreciate the fact that prayers were emphasized here. Whereas in New York, that wasn't necessarily the case. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. It was more on the, the social side. The social, right. yeah. Right. Okay. See, and there were elements of the right. social side here, but right, of course. also, but uh, like the minister that, uh, Minister Henry Majid, who was the minister in San Francisco in the 60s, uh, he was one of the uh, 
people who opened their mosques in, in San Diego in the 50s as well, uh, he had a spiritual leaning. So he uh, taught a lot from the Bible. He also taught from the Quran. And uh, I guess my needs as individually also caused me to incline to the spiritual, spiritual side. side. Right. So now slowly these changes are happening. I know the the University of Islam becomes the... Uh, the uh, Clara uh, Muhammad that's Schools. That's right, right. Yeah, right, Sister Clara Muhammad Schools. Uh, you've got now the World Community of Islam in the West is one of right. the incantate, in, in, you know, incarnations, right. which later becomes what? The American Muslim Mission? I think in the early 80s now? Yeah, uh, actually, American Muslim Mission, yeah. after World Community of Islam... We, uh, to identify our uh, organization to the public, we had the term American Muslim Mission. That's right. And then after American Muslim Mission, we became the American Society, Society of Muslims. Muslims. And then there was another organization that had the same name that they had incorporated. Right. So we changed it to uh, American Muslim Society, you know, just because right. we didn't want the conflict with That's the right. other organization. Uh, but Imam W.D. Muhammad emphasized that we really don't want an organizational name as much as we want to identify with the universal teachings of Islam that we find in the Quran and the life of Prophet Muhammad. But for the for the benefit of the public who want to see uh, us as a as a unified body, we'll use a name for their benefit. Mm. But uh, some of the um, uh, liabilities in having ourselves tied together organizationally is what we experienced upon the death of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad when Imam Muhammad became the leader and uh, they enacted the FBI Hoover plan and tied up all of our properties and acquisitions in court saying that all of the uh, progress the Nation of Islam made that those properties belonged to Elijah Muhammad personally. So they tied up our schools, our businesses, our mosque, our farmland, in a probate court case that lasted from 1976 to maybe 1990. And that was also some of the other children of, of Elijah Muhammad were also in litigation against, like, I mean, there were right, big right. There were, right. There were, there were I'm already left. I believe, 63 children that got involved in the, saying that they were his children. I don't know if all 63 of them were actual actually, biological children. Right. right. But that that encumbered the community and 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 uh, kept us in this long protracted struggle. Right. And we lost the teachers college that we had in Sedalia, American Muslim Teachers College, mm -hmm. which was actually the first accredited teachers college in the United States. That was established in 1980. Uh, and we got our accreditation through the hard work of uh, Imam Matthew Bilal Hamidullah from North Carolina, who later became uh, uh, a chaplain and then a warden at a federal prison. He had a double doctorate degree mm -hmm. and very, very intelligent man. Right. So now, going back to the early 80s then, um, this is also when uh, sort of Louis Farrakhan rises within the ranks of the nation and sort of takes the nation or... Well, Louis Farrakhan was there uh, with Malcolm, right. just to give you some historical background. Yes, yes. Please. He was trained by Malcolm. He was one of the student ministers under Minister Malcolm. Uh, out of, and uh, he was uh, eventually became the minister of the mosque in Boston. And then when uh, Malcolm uh, was relieved of his responsibilities in New York, he was reassigned to New York. Okay. Uh, he was reassigned to New York without the full authority that the other ministers had uh, because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad at that time was not wanting to see another situation like the one had, had occurred with Malcolm. Uh, and then uh, Minister Farrakhan stayed with Imam W.D. Muhammad for a period of approximately three years. And then uh, he got moved from New York to Chicago uh, reportedly because there were threats on his life. Mm -hmm. So the national officials at that time proposed to Imam W.D. Muhammad that they relocate Minister Farrakhan to Chicago so he wouldn't, so his life wouldn't be in danger. And then uh, after some period of time, he was uh, 
he said he wanted to work with the people who were having difficulty with the transition. Okay. And Imam W.D. Muhammad didn't oppose him in that and actually gave him his blessings. I see. And then a uh, short period, uh, sometime after that, he restarted the old Nation of Islam after staying with Imam W.D. Muhammad for about three years. And then uh, he restarted the old Nation of Islam. Nation of Islam. Then when he got cancer, he felt... Uh, he didn't want. He he felt that he was near his deathbed, and he he said he called some of his officials together and said he didn't want his legacy to be one of division. So he tried to reunite uh, the communities again. That's that's much later. That's like the nineties, ninety five. Yeah, that's right. I remember that vividly. Right. Uh, uh, but so 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 then going back, I mean, you know, and a lot of people don't realize, and I mean, this is actually one. In fact, one of the points that. We touched on in the first episode where, you know, this is a chapter in, in not only the history of Islam in America, but the history of Islam in general, period, right, right. in terms of mass conversion, probably right. the largest mass conversion, right. certainly in the West, if not in the history of Islam, from, right. you know, into Islam that right. happens under the auspices of, you know, every man W.D. Muhammad. I mean, that's something that I think... Is hundreds of chapter. hundreds and hundreds of thousands oh, of people. Certainly, I mean, you maybe even half Muslims. a million. I mean, yeah, we're talking, right. yeah, tens of thousands. Yes, yes. I would say easily right. five hundred thousand right. became Muslims right. and received, uh, gave, the, were given their shahada by That's Imam right. Deputy Imam. That's right. And it was a great chapter in my life. Uh, I remember being. Uh, in San Quentin, serving a life sentence. I had been released from death row, and then I began to listen to Imam W.D. Muhammad, and uh, I could see a way out of that prison situation because the language was different. Mm -hmm. Whereas the old message, I was hoping for the destruction of America and the walls falling down at the prison. That might be a way I could get out. (laughs) And now this is more of a message of hope. This was a message of hope, and it was a more, it was a, a message, a, a message of uh, human reformation, right. and that the human being has a, a, a redemptive value. Right. So, you know, I began to become very hopeful. Actually, I was actually hopeful even under the Nation of Islam teachings because yeah. I believe that if God was a just God, then it didn't make sense that I would die with this new enlightenment that I had. Right. I could understand dying. In the ignorance that I was in. Uh-huh. But it didn't make sense that God would give a person enlightenment to die with it. Wow. So I felt uh, very strongly that God would not allow me to die on death row. I even had that discussion with people on death row and they said I was kind of spaced out a little bit. And I was like, no. So now, I'd love to bring the, story, like, bring the conversation back to your story and I think okay. you did that beautifully. Um, and so then you're released and you are now here in Oakland. Northern California, Northern in Oakland. California, living in San Rafael, attending okay. the mass here in Oakland. Okay, and now that also in, that, that directly put, brings your path uh, with Imam W. D. Muhammad, who happens to be here already. Or no, comes he after? was he was visiting here uh-huh. on a regular basis. Uh, so I was released December the fourth, nineteen seventy eight. Okay, and at that time, Imam uh, Muhammad Abdullah from Pakistan was our Imam mm-hmm. here at the Masjid in Oakland. And uh, Imam W.D. Muhammad would make maybe a couple of visits a year to the area. Sometimes he would come for the Eids and things like that. And sometimes he would come for fundraising dinners and things of that nature. Uh, so Is Imam Muhammad in Chicago? He, at that I, time, I he was living point. in Chicago. Okay. And he stays there. I mean, he's staying much. there, and he's the Imam at the mosque right. that, on Stony Island at that time. So then he comes here, and then th- that becomes sort of permanent then? He actually, uh, Muhammad Abdullah, because of health reasons, he was an older man. Uh, he could no longer f- f- fulfill his duties as imam. Uh, he was being assisted at that time by Imam Usman Meki, uh, Benjamin Nuruddin, and Bashir Salam, the imam from San Francisco, Sacramento, and Richmond. Okay. Because when we bought the property on 47th Avenue, uh, the other properties closed, and we consolidated ourselves okay. and uh, and opened the school there also, the full-time school. Uh, and then after Imam Muhammad Abdullah could no longer fulfill those duties, Imam Andrew Mustafa Hassan, who was given a name by Malcolm X as Andrew Can Do, 
<laughs> he came into Islam in the 50s and okay. you know worked with Malcolm in helping set up temples and he's helped set up temples in Los Angeles, okay. Fresno, okay. Bakersfield, Vallejo mm. and uh, Richmond. Mm. So he was a worker and uh, he became the imam here in Oakland for for about a, a year and then he was having difficulties uh he didn't get a ratification vote from the membership. Right. And the Imam W.D. Muhammad came here to assist him with that situation and asked the community if we would, they would accept him as Imam. Okay. And we uh, obviously, we overjoyed that we were That's right. yeah. overjoyed that he wanted to be the Imam here. So we accepted him as our Imam and he okay. stayed here for about a year. Okay. And, uh, you know, had some wonderful classes. He did a lot of dawa. Did a lot of interfaith work. Right. He uh, trained a lot of people. Exposed us to uh, some very intensive studies of the Quran and the life of the Prophet. And you That's know, right. we had a wonderful time uh, while he lived here in Oakland. Okay. And then when he left, he appointed me as the Imam, and I was young and a little impetuous, uh -huh. and uh, got into a little political trouble. Wrote the Pope a letter that uh, was uh, requesting uh, a conversation between him and Imam W. D. That's Muhammad right. about Pope racial. Pope John Paul II. No. Oh, no. Yeah, was yeah, it? yeah. Was it Pope John yeah. Paul II? Yeah, it was. I think it was. Right. Regarding right. racial right. images and religion. That's right. And it was a strategy that we had developed to do Dawa. CRAID, a C R A I D. Committee for the Removal of All Images That Attempt to Portray the Divine. Which was essentially the portrayal of Jesus as white and. and, and yeah, but and all, of course, all of course, images, but all particularly images Jesus. That's right. That's what right. happens to the minds of little black children that That's sit right. in churches for 300 right. years worshiping the purported image of the divine? And we said that it really causes psychological damage. Mm -hmm. It causes a child to develop inferiority complexes, especially when he goes out into a world and sees everybody, everything being ran by that image. Correct. And, you know, it's stacking the deck against a person. That's right. So, uh, so you write this letter to the Pope. Sorry, I want to right. go. Yeah. And I didn't respect the protocol, chain of command. Ah. And uh, as a result of that, he flew back to Oakland, relieved me from my position. Uh, it was a political decision on his part. And he told me privately, he said, "You'll be better in your fall than you were in your rise." And <laughs> And I continued to work and be of service to the community. So this is like early 80s. Yes. Imam Fahim then becomes Imam Then there? Imam okay. Fahim becomes okay. Imam that okay. same day. <laughs> Imam Fahim and I Shway. worked with yeah. Imam Fahim and supported him until uh, the Imam in San Francisco got sick and they okay. needed Imam. And they asked Fahim to send somebody. He recommended me. They interviewed four people and they ended up selecting me. And uh, yeah. I've been there ever since. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, sorry. Go ahead. A second. Yeah. What I find fascinating, and you know, and, and I'd like to maybe sort of close the loop if you, if if we can, on on the story of Imam W. D. Muhammad and his legacy, uh, is is just the ability to continue to work and continue to evolve and to continue to bring the community, um, you know, I mean, or continue to follow a trajectory that he had in his own in his own vision. Right. Reg not, I don't want to say regardless, but. But 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 as the the sort of authority, you know, the, the the power shifts, you know, with the influx of the immigrant community post nineteen sixty five, and 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 all of that's going on, and there's this sort of the vacuum of the authoritative voice of, of sort of who represents Islam. Meanwhile, you know, Imam W. Muhammad and the community just keep trekking on, and and it's just I think that that to me is is, is, is fascinating, and I think a real part of the legacy. Well, I think uh, one of the uh, salient yeah. points that Imam W. D. Muhammad made to us mm -hmm. in regards to his leadership. Okay. Because the question did come uh, by people who uh, wanted to displace his leadership, I'll say, of where was he educated? Right. You know, who who did he get his ijazah from? There you go. All of these, you know, kind of concerns came from people who well, not working in our community. No, no, this is coming in from Didn't the immigrant. Work, flux, work, I mean, work we're concerned about the conditions that we were faced with or anything. Right. And they were actually trying to choose for us who our leaders should be. That's right. So uh, one of the things that Imam Muhammad said was that 
he didn't claim uh, scholarship, okay. though he had he was scholarly. If you look the word up in the dictionary, he fit the description Certainly. to a T. He was scholarly mm-hmm. in his pursuit of knowledge, and Allah blessed him with insights. Uh, I would say comparable with the great thinkers of old, and uh, he said he was blessed. Right. So leadership essentially is influence. Mm-hmm. Now the influence on him was his own nature and his love for the Quran, his love for for truth, his love for humanity. Those were the motivations in his life. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, he became a influential individual because Allah blessed him with leadership. And he was blessed to be genuine and authentic. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't feigning leadership. He was generally concerned about uh, people. Right. Muslims and non-Muslims as well. That's right. uh, he also was concerned about the struggling uh, Muslim societies like the Palestinians and Afghanistan Mujahideen. He was very concerned about those struggles faced with those individuals. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, was, he was a blessed person. Mm-hmm. And he was also very successful in uh, sharing the love and devotion to the study of the Quran with millions of people. And uh, I think he's a, a leader that is unparalleled. Absolutely. Rahim mm-hmm. Allah. That's yeah. right. So, you know, I think that uh, that question is answered because he still is uh, a forerunner for us in terms of uh, what he did. He lived his life as also uh, some symbols when you look at the symbolic uh, history of Jesus Christ, you know, he was born, mysterious kind of birth. Mm -hmm. We don't see or hear from him again until he's 12 years old. Mm -hmm. Then after 12, we don't hear from him again until he's 30. Mm -hmm. And he has a three-year ministry, and then after that, he's allegedly put on the cross. Well, Imam W.D. Muhammad, mysterious kind of birth. Mm -hmm. Teacher put his initials on the back door. That's mystery. Mm-hmm. Then he's born in 1933. So these symbols, these things fit. Interesting. Then he's over temple number 12. Right? Mm. His ministry lasted 33 years from December, I mean from February 1975 to uh, September 2008. That's 33 years. That's right. So these things, they fit. Right. Now, for a person who's a thinker, and you see these coincidences. Are there coincidences? Are these signs from Allah mm. that this type of enlightened figure is here again? And then when you look in the history of mythology and things like that, we know Jesus Christ was not the only savior type. Different cultures have always had savior types. Right. Now, I'm not elevating Imam W.D. Muhammad to a savior type, but was he an enlightened leader? Did he have insights into knowledge that... He wasn't schooled in, just like Jesus, when he went into the temples at 12 years old and began to question the rabbis. And, you know, he wasn't schooled in their knowledge, but he was able to question them. (laughs) So Imam W.D. Muhammad was able to do the same thing. And that that nature, that that, spiritual insight. And and, and then when you look at Jesus Christ and what his name means, Al-Masi, Al-Masi means one wiped clean. Mm -hmm. And Imam W.D. Muhammad, clean record throughout his whole life. I know people who grew up with him, went to school with him. And uh, when they would get in trouble, they didn't want people to know, he, him to know they had got in trouble. <laughs> One kid was telling, uh, he said they were uh, throwing rocks at a train and broke some windows and went to the police, police department, got in trouble, and they didn't want him to know about it. Don't let Wallace know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because he had a moral position, even as a, a young man, a teenager, you know. So he was a blessed individual, and we uh, should always be seeking God's blessing on our ourselves, but also on our family members and our children. Right. And we hope God will continue to give us blessed souls like that right. uh, for the future. Right? No, I mean, I, I consider I was in I was in Chicago in September 2008, and I consider that as one of sort of my like big life moments to to have been there just right. by coincidence. And having attended the funeral of Imam W.D. Muhammad uh, at the uh, Islamic Foundation, right. uh, and yes. 
and Brother Dogar, Doctor or Dogar Sabu was like the Imam slash, right. and yeah, right. he led the prayer and. You know, a, a close friend of Imam W. D. Muhammad. I think that he had sort of helped Imam W. Muhammad out during a time when he was uh, sort of exiled from the community. And, I believe they went on highs together right. in uh, 1967. I think I saw a picture of uh, of uh, Dr. Dogard, Imam Muhammad, uh, Ahmed Sakar, um, Metwali Amr in Sacramento, who's one of the founding members of ISNA, along with Dr. Akbar Of course, yeah. Started with the MSA, MSA in 1963. MSA in 1963. Yeah, 1963. Right. University of Illinois. Illinois. That's right. That's 20 right. miles from where I was born. Is that right? Is that right? In no. Champaign, Urbana. Champaign, that's right. Champaign, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. University of Illinois. in Danville, yeah. UIUC. Um, no, no, it's fascinating. I mean, I imagine. Were you there? I mean, were you able to I was one it? of the few people that oh, were asked well, to carry Imam Muhammad's body. So yeah, I was oh, in a blessed yes. position. It was an honor, privilege. Yeah. Uh, so myself, many Imam Abdul Kareem Hassan, right. Imam Ezekiel Pasha out of New York, mm-hmm. Imam Yaki Abdullah out of Texas, of course, and uh, Rafa Muhammad. We were the six people that right. carried, and uh, Abdul Razak Muhammad Sharif out of uh, Denver, Colorado. We Thousands were, of people. Uh, yeah, it was easy. Yeah. Twenty thousand people there easily, was, and. Uh, all of the major sort of organizations and Muslim leadership were represented there. Imam Siraj was there, Dr. Right. Salman Yang, Dr. Jackson, and shit. Right. Hamza, Imam right. Zaid, all the people you think yeah. of, they're all there. Right, yeah. right. And uh, show you Allah's favor on us. You know, we found out the man passed, and then we had like three or four days to get plane tickets. Right. And I actually got about 40 people plane tickets for under a $200 round trip. <laughs> wow. It was amazing. That's it was right. like Allah lowered the bar for us. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to afford to go there. I was able to take my family members. Some oh, of them okay. went with me. And, yeah. 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 So, I mean, when, when we talk about the history of Islam in this country, you know, just, just to sort of underscore it, I mean, what, what, when, we, when we look at the, the high-level, big-picture big narrative, what would you say is the role that Imam Muhammad played in that story? Uh, I believe Imam W.D. Muhammad was uh, a reformer in that he uh, grew up in a community that didn't have Islam purely, the pure teachings of Islam, and he was around those who claimed to have the pure teachings of Islam but didn't have uh, the interests of the broader community in mind. So he was a reformer, and in addition to being a reformer, he was a a free thinker who thought outside the limitations of his current circumstances and had a vision for the future and forged the kind of relationships that uh, were foundation laying for us to have a a stable uh, future in America without uh, contradictions. So I see him as a liberator, I see him as a freedom fighter, and I see him as a lover of Muhammad the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and a lover of Allah's word. Uh, He was a preeminent leader. Though he wasn't seeking uh, accolades, he wasn't the kind of person that sought to put himself above uh, the masses. He was a servant, a true servant of the noble ideas we find in the Quran. Well, I mean, I think I think that nicely sort of puts a pin on puts a puts a bow around everything we've been talking about. I mean, I think I think this is this is a fascinating chapter of the American Muslim experience that uh, I think doesn't get illuminated enough, That's I think. Right. So, I mean, I'm I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to sort of get this this living history by virtue of of your own experiences. Right. Now, I mean, as fascinating as that history is, I mean, is there an effort within the community to preserve it, to, to, to publish it? Is that anything happening right now or in the works? Sure, there. You know? One of the things that Imam Muhammad did, I think, that was uh, guided by Allah is he gave a lot of individuals and groups uh, authority right. to preserve his knowledge. Mm-hmm and share it with the public and to publicize it. So there's a Imam W.D. Muhammad uh, Library Project. 
You can go online, and most of his lectures have been transcribed and are there online, going back from 1975 all the way up to 2008. Uh, some of them are audio, some of them are video, and uh, that's an effort that's underway. Uh, and then he's given some other individuals responsibility. He used to meet with a group of uh, uh, imams and teachers uh, every uh, Thursday, and he would share insights with them. And the uh, intent was for them to publicize that information. Uh, there's one publication that's out now by uh, Ronald Shaheed, Imam in uh, uh, Milwaukee. And uh, it's called Thoughts for Seekers. And it's just some of those Thursday conversations that they had. And he's publicized that. And there are other works that are underway. Imam Dr. Nasser Ahmed out of Miami, Florida. He's compiled a lot of the uh, Imam's lectures and transcribed them. And we believe they're uh, beneficial, not only in terms of the, the Quranic insights, but in terms of the insight he had into the societal structure, uh, American government, and you know some of the rich ideas that went in the formation of this society. And then the history of how he forged relationships with uh, diverse groups, such as uh, the Focolari, Catholics, the Baptists. There was one Baptist preacher uh, out of Chicago by the name of uh, uh, T.L. Barrett when Imam W.D. Muhammad encouraged us to adopt the name Bilal, Bilalian, Bilalian as an ethnic group. Uh, this individual, T.L. Barrett, he enthusiastically accepted the charge. Say, don't call me African American. Don't call me Afro American. Don't call me Negro. Don't call me black. Don't call me colored. Call me Bilalian. And he changed his name to Taman El Bilali. Yeah, right. Christian preacher, you know. Right. So, you know, and then uh, people don't know uh, Imam W.D. Muhammad started an effort called New World Patriotism Day, 1976. He picked up the American flag. Uh -huh. He said, we want a new world patriotism, not old world patriotism, new world patriotism. And uh, he began an effort for all the ethnic groups in Chicago to come together on July the 4th and proudly display their if ethnic allegiance to American society. Hmm. Uh, and now that, that has turned into what they call the Taste of Chicago. Now it's a two-week-long event that <laughs> wow, takes place. Yeah. Well, it's like he's from Chicago. <laughs> I mean, right. yeah. 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 Taste of Chicago started out with New World I had Patriotism no Day. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and what part of Chicago are you from? Uh, I grew up in the suburbs, so, okay. so okay. near near uh, Naperville and Schaumburg, right. kind of in the middle of there. Okay. Yeah, I'm from Danville originally, Danville, oh, okay. Illinois. So oh, I've, nice. I've got family still in Chicago, yeah. out on uh, the south side, 109th and Parnell. And family used to live on Jeffrey. And, yeah, so I know the area. Yeah, it's, it'll always be home. I've been here for ten more than 10 years now, but... Yeah. I'm still still Chicagoan. So now, I mean, I, I, to conclude, to sort of conclude with maybe the the, the, the next chapter within the community, um, was there an effort or was there a discussion that takes place or maybe a conversation that even Imam uh, Muhammad has near the end of his life in terms of continuing the leadership role, or was there a con like a conscious decision to to, to, to not have a centralized uh, right. leader anymore after after he passes? Yeah, he said different things about that. Okay. You know, he told some people to make sure we don't have a centralized leader. Mm. He told all of us that. Mm. But he also told particular individuals to make sure certain people don't position themselves to be in that role. He was mm. protecting the community from certain types. Right. Uh, and he also uh, was questioned once, I believe it was in 2008, I actually was present. And uh, a sister asked, she said, uh, Imam, uh, what's going to happen when you're gone? Right. And will we get another leader? He said, yeah, I think so. He said, I think you'll get a leader just like me. And that's how he left it. Right. Uh, now, will we get an another leader just like him? You know, there's different ways you can look at it. There's one him. Right. So... His leadership can continue, and we'll have a leader just like him, mm -hmm. because his leadership is not his flesh. Mm -hmm. His leadership is his influence, right. and what influenced him most was the Quran. 
So the Quran is the leader. So that's one of the things he taught us too. The Quran is the leader, but it has to be represented in the, in the life of a person. He said Prophet Muhammad is always the leader, but we have to have that representation in a person. So, uh, you know, I, I think his leadership continues because number one, uh, what he did was because he was blessed with the circumstances to lead an organization. And he freed that organization. He gave us autonomy. Mm. He didn't want us under the structures of an organization that could be exploited by government forces and could be exploited by forces from within. From within, right. You know, Malcolm, he left the Nation of Islam because of forces within. Mm -hmm. Imam Deputy Muhammad left the Nation of Islam because of forces within. There were people that, you know, tried to get him killed, you know, because they felt threatened by his uh, approach to the Quran, approach to the religion, and uh, God blessed him. You know, Allah blessed him. So I don't believe that we'll have a, a, another leader like that. Number one, because the circumstances don't fit. We don't have a situation like the one he inherited. Correct. And uh, personally, I don't believe we need one leader. You know, as a student of the world and history, I remember when Russia invaded Afghanistan in the late 70s. And I went to a State Department debriefing in 1979 over in Marin County, over in, I believe we were in uh, uh, Mill Valley. And they were having this State Department debriefing. And what the State Department described as the chief, chief weakness of the Afghanistan freedom fighters was there was no central authority. That was their uh, assessment. Right. And there was no central authority so they thought they couldn't coordinate the resources to fight the superpower Russia but because they had no central authority and each area used their own uh, intelligence to approach the enemy they there was no one strategy they could work against and that proved to be Russia's undoing that's right so I believe even works. today right you know, Allah has put us in a situation where we can thrive and flourish with local leadership. And then we have to have uh, the consciousness to cooperate with one another and strengthen one another as much as we can. But Prophet Muhammad is always a leader. And Imam Devadi Muhammad emphasized that. A lot of people don't know how much he emphasized that because uh, of their own needs. Some people need... Uh, a crutch mm -hmm. I'll put it like that uh, but Imam W.D. Muhammad was a liberator and he wanted us to be authentic in our approach to him but also in our approach to our responsibility as community members you know. Thanks. Well I think that's a great place to leave our conversation I want to thank uh, you uh, Imam Abu Khadr for taking the time to, to share your experiences with us and uh, like I said, I, uh, I think uh, for many of our listeners, this is going to be sort of new terrain. So I'm, I'm grateful that we get to sort of preserve this. These, these yeah, and I hope we'll, 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 we'll have an opportunity to talk again in the future. I you hope know, so. Some of the things that, because it's such a vast area, when you talk about a person's leadership uh, over a period of 33 years, there's a lot of things that actually happen. Of you course. Know, his emphasis on education. I believe we have more Muslims who graduated from college on his leadership than ever before. We had more businesses that opened under his leadership that were not Nation of Islam business, but individual business. Correct. I think we had uh, uh, more marriages stabilized and people staying together and family strengthened and neighborhood improvement. We even have some people who had the courage to start cities. Under his leadership, we have New Medina, Mississippi, New Medina, right. you know, and uh, other efforts like that. Uh, and uh, you know, I think the future is bright. Well, that's great. Well, I'm sure we'll we'll hopefully uh, plan to pick up this conversation at some point down the line because I know that people will definitely want to hear that. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And uh, on behalf of my co-host, Pervez Ahmed, my name is Zaki Hassan. This is the Diffuse Congruence Show, and uh, please do look us up. 
on Facebook. We are on facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence. You can also shoot us an email at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Let us know how we're doing. You can find us on iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, so please do write us a review or leave us a star rating. Every little bit helps. And uh, until next month, thank you for listening. <laughs>